We begin today's recording by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are on. I am on Burrawang land. Where are you, Breeza? I am on the land of the Jajarurung people. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are tuning in today. And wherever you're listening to the potty today, make sure you know whose land you're on. Join us each week for some booze-free banter about life without booze. If you're entertaining cutting back your booze by a day, a week, a month, or for the rest of your life, we would love for you to tune in. Buckle up and come along for a ride that may just change your life. Just a heads up, some of the conversations we have may be triggering. Reach out to your local support centre in Australia. That's Lifeline 131144. Crack a can. <laughs> this is my little <laughs> crack a can sound. <laughs> I'm, I'm following up with some garnish. Yeah, nice. What do we got, mate? So I've got um, Altina La Vie in the Rosé. Oh, God. Crack that can. And I've nearly downed it because we've just finished recording the potty. What have you got? What garnishes have you got? Well, I've got the blood orange, the strawberry and the cinnamon quills because I've been so piggy on the Altina. I've got none left. <laughs> Clean out. I'm dry. But you can get these in the um, the Sans Gria mulled wine kit. Yes. Yes. Well, Maiso, here's my little bit of advice for you. You need to jump online at www.altinadrinks.com. You need to plug in the discount code BFB10 and that will get you 10% off Altina drinks. And that's for everyone. All our listeners, jump on board. Get amongst it. We love you, Altina. Thank you, Altina. Maiso. Breeza. <laughs> How are you? I'm so, I'm so good. So up and about after our oh. yes. Oh, my God. We've just had the best guests on and I'm actually going to uh, go to LinkedIn to give his intro because there's a bit going on and I don't want to yep. butcher it and I probably will. Come at me. Do you want to, do, like, do the drum roll, please? <laughs> oh. ding. <laughs> 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 <Okay. laughs> We've just had on Ray Ellis. He is, I'm just going to LinkedIn, he is the CEO of First National Real Estate and has been since 2004, which is Did like... Yet. LinkedIn's telling me it's 18 years and nine months. That's huge. <laughs> he was the CEO of Melbourne Football Club. Go oh, Dees! Amazing. <laughs> he was the Director of Sales and Marketing in Asia Pacific for BTI Australia and he was also the Managing Director for the Event Centre. He's got a huge um He's got huge experience in marketing. He also is a speaker, Meso. Did you know that? Yeah. He's a public speaker. Yeah. So he has extensive experience with strategic planning, implementation, managing direction, change culture, crisis management, corporate governance, everything else. <laughs> and here's the kicker. Go. You go, Meso. You go. <laughs> you probably don't know what I'm about to say. <laughs> no. <laughs> he has never drank. Unbelievable. He's never, he's never been drunk. Never been drunk. He is a ray of sunshine. <laughs> he is. A <laughs> of he really is. He and really is. Wowee. I, just, I think everyone will have a lot to learn from this podcast. I know I got a lot, I got a lot out of it. I know you did too, Meso. We yeah. were just like sitting there in awe, listening to every word he was saying. So what do you reckon, Meso? Oh, let's get him in. I'm That's just so nice. uplifted. I feel really his positive energy. I'm yeah, real so up and about. Yeah. Don't you reckon? I feel like I've had a and pep the list, talk. Yeah, the listeners will be across it too. So, ah, oh, I can't wait for you to You're listen. You love this, guys. Let's get amongst it with Ray Ellis. A big, warm, booze free bants. A welcome to our very special guest, Ray Ellis. Ray, welcome to booze free bants. Pleasure Ray. to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to it. Great. It's all our pleasure. We're actually, you're actually one of the first, um, I would say, mature age males that we've had on the podcast. So this is, this is, um, new territory for us. <laughs> it's a big deal, Ray. It's all on you. <laughs> I, I, I like to be a groundbreaker and, uh, let's see how we go. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, I'm just going to have a little disclaimer because normally we are throw our guests straight into the deep end with a confession session, but this time it's a little bit different because you have never been sozzled, have you, Ray? No. Never. No, no, <laughs> no concept. As a good friend of mine says, uh, I have no idea what it's like to wake up the next morning and it, it, I can, it's the best I can be. So I'm so <laughs> fascinated by that. Do you ever, is it, I don't know, do you ever wonder, do you, is there just that curiosity? No, it's 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 ne never. I, I don't. You know, 
when I didn't start, start drinking, it was a big deal back in those days. And now you go to a function, a third of the audience drink mineral water, don't drink, designated drivers. So it's an accepted part of society now, whatever. So I, I'm a big believer in getting high on life, get high on enjoyment of the friends and the family and the food and the children and the grandchildren, everyone around you or whatever, and the, the beautiful views you're looking and the concert you're at. Um, I don't see a need to have any addition to that. I don't make criticism of those who do. I don't make judgment in any shape or form. It doesn't bother me at all. But uh, I, my grandmother said to me many, many years ago, if you can enjoy the mundane things in life, you will have a very happy life. And oh, uh, quote, if you, <laughs> quote if, of the day. If, if, you, if you're always looking for the great excitement of that view from the Eiffel Tower or standing on Niagara Falls or whatever, that only happens once, twice, maybe three times in your life. But if you can get enjoyment out of the smell of the grass you've just mowed or the smile someone gave you or a phone call or whatever, you will have a happy life. Oh, what, I'm what so amazing, happy. What amazing uh, words from your grandmother. Um, when did, how old were you when you heard those words, Ray? Probably 25, 26. Yeah, right. That's such an influential time of your life as well. Yeah. Um, so can you take us back, Ray? What Growing up, was alcohol around you? What was your, what was your exposure to booze from a young age? Um, well, I mean, I, I grew up in a more, I would say, a pretty normal household, but uh, the great experience of my childhood was I went to 13 primary schools and uh, that was all around Australia. My father was very involved with the Army and the Vietnam War was on at the time, so we would change schools every three, four, six months. Um, so. Wow. The um, I, I don't certainly remember being drinking culture as being a huge part of the family life or whatever, but they were rough and tumble soldiers and uh, that didn't influence me in one way or the other. It just seemed to be a, a normal part of life and uh, not like a European background where wine is a part of the family meal from your eight, nine and ten or something. So I didn't have any bad experience in that environment, didn't have any good experience. It was, it was just life. Yep. Yeah, right. Well, then what was your decision not to drink, Ray? Was there an actual defining moment that led you to that decision not to drink? Very good question, Claire. I was very serious about my football as a young man. And uh, I can remember being, I don't know, 17, 18 or 19 and at the football club and looking down the bar and there was two what I thought were old men just sitting there, too fat, um, not necessarily drunk, but... Uh, and uh, they just didn't give me a good image. And, uh, and uh, little to me, I didn't know, but, you know, they were only 29, 30, 31. Oh, um, but how, to how me, old were you? Sorry, Ray, I missed I was 17, 18, 17, 19, yeah. 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 And I can just remember thinking, I don't want to end up being an old man like that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I just didn't think it was in. So I just thought that that, that was it. And, um, you yeah, know, so it wasn't a great big road to Damascus. And, uh yeah, I, I, you asked me to be vulnerable. I'm opening up to things here I probably don't talk about a lot, but uh, it's for the benefit of your listeners, hopefully. Mm. So it wasn't a great big, like I said, road to Damascus moment. It was just, a, nah, I don't, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be, you know, in 10 years' time, I don't want to be sitting at this bar like him with another young man looking at me like that or whatever. So that's that's probably what started it. Mm. That's Unreal. So <laughs> sliding door moment. Yeah. <laughs> like, and what so, insight to think that's not what I want to be. Yeah. You know, that's incredible. We, um, we often speak to guests on this podcast, Ray, and one of the questions we ask them is when, like, how old were you, were you when you started drinking? And a lot of the time it's that sort of, in Australia, that, you know, 14, 15, 16 mark. Yeah. Were you, um, was there an, a moment where you were influenced by someone or peer pressure? Was there any of that in your uh, friendship circle growing up for you to drink or was it you just not exposed to that? No, the, uh, I was, um, you know, we, we all have you know, three to ten people we can count on in life. Um, and half of mine are from that group of friends at school. You know, we, we, we were serious about football. You know, every second day we were serious about school. Uh, we were serious about chasing girls uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and, uh, and surfing and all, all those normal sort of things. So it, it didn't – it wasn't a part of our culture – to, to do it, to drink heavily in any shape or form. I certainly have lots of friends that drink. They don't drink heavily, but they drink, and a, l a lot of them are those friends at that time. But uh, we were just more interested in football and surfing and enjoying ourselves, and, uh, you know, this was, this was the time when the, you know, the Coca-Cola ads were all about a great surfing lifestyle and, you know, bikinis and beaches or whatever, and so it was probably a bit of a conflict for that if you want to delve into it, but not really. It, was just, it just never, never came up. Mm. My mind is blown. Just <laughs> I can't same, same. 
<laughs> but I look at, yeah, me as a teenager and, you know, it was a thrill to go out and drink. Like that's what we did. And I know yeah. I'm not alone in that. So I'm, I'm just, my mind is blown, Ray, that you had such a different um, experience. Well, I certainly remember, and uh, you're taking me down memory lane now, the, um, I've never drunk it, but, uh, you know, when I used to go to parties, the big drink that people used to big was Dram Buey. I have no idea what oh. that is, but yeah. <laughs> people would say, oh, have a dram, Buey, have a dram. I said, no, I'm just having water. Well, in those days, mineral water didn't exist. Um, yeah. Soda water didn't exist. Um, you had lemonade and that was it. And, uh, you know, so, uh, but, oh, yeah, and I was a novelty. Um, you know, so here's someone that didn't drink or whatever. But yeah. um, it, had, it had its other advantages. <laughs> yeah, the real OG. That's why you look so fresh. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Um, well, Ray, you are widely successful in your career yeah. in real estate and yeah. other business ventures. Anyone can take a look at your LinkedIn and be really impressed by your CV. Yeah. Thank you. You've been at the helm of First Real Estate National um, since 2004. For our overseas listener, listeners, um, it is Australia's largest real estate. Yeah. Um, can you talk to us about alcohol in the corporate world from your point of view? I think the... Um I have great concerns for young Australians, but we're all young once, so young people should change the world and expand things and try things or whatever, just there's a lot more opportunities to um, try stupid things, uh, which my generation didn't didn't get involved in. Um, so the, the, the culture of just drinking till you're blind drunk, I think, is actually increasing. Um, I don't see that as a good thing. Um, a, the cost of it be the social consequences of it and be the development of your life. Um, not that I get exposed to it in any great shape or form, so I'm making observations from afar. Um, I think that's a tragedy for our, our society. But in, in, in the corporate world, obviously drinking is part of it. Mm-hmm. And, um, again, um, I don't think many people that associate with me see me as, as a prudish person in any shape or form. But I, I don't think people drink heavily around me. I don't think they make a conscious choice. But uh, if I attend a corporate event, be an award ceremony or a function or like the grand final events here in Melbourne last last weekend, great day for my team, the Swans, really, really enjoying their post celebration. <laughs> <laughs> So okay. it's one of the but the, but the, but that 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 that's life. I've got many friends who are cats people, so I, yeah. I'm I'm letting them enjoy it as they should do. It was fantastic. Breathe but, um, them. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think the um that that should be part of it. You know, we should celebrate drinking good wines, whether they're from Australia or someone else. We sh- we should enjoy. One of my best friends enjoys a double Johnny Walker Black um with ice, and we we travel together, and uh, we have great times with, and all those sorts of things. So. I, I'm not surrounded by anyone who excessively drinks to the point where they where they can't stand up. But my experience in the corporate world, which is all around Australia, the world, and New Zealand or whatever, I very rarely, if there's a room of 300 people, there might be one or two people that have, you know, overindulged or whatever, and we generally accommodate them. But I, I, I see a responsibility there, and I think the uh, the messages of road safety over the last 20 years have certainly helped that. Yeah. The days of the long lunch which you ladies are too young to remember, have certainly disappeared. <laughs> I've heard well- stories, right? <laughs> <laughs> is it well-known part of the corporate world that you don't drink? Is it well-known? Have you got the um, reputation Ray doesn't drink? Yeah, I, I think it would be. I, I don't want to get ahead of myself here. The, um, I don't think people make a conscious choice about my personal habits. But if I if I go to a function, virtually everyone I know um, would know that, uh, that I don't drink and um, – that doesn't stop me getting anywhere between 20 and, you know, 50 bottles of scotch delivered as a Christmas present every yeah. year, um, which my staff and friends enjoy that because uh, they're well looked after. But, uh, yes, it would be well known. <laughs> I think um, it all comes down to um, being um, inclusive to yeah. everyone. There's actually a fella based in Sydney, a corporate guy. I can't think of his name. It escapes me. But he's started an organisation called Green Tray, which accommodates for corporate events. And um, he, the green tray that gets passed around will have non-alcoholic drinks on it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's about in, including everybody, whether you're drinking well, or not drinking. It's a question you raised before, Bree, about you know, peer pressure. I don't think there's a peer pressure anymore in the corporate world to do that. I'm sure if you're a young man 20 or 30 years ago starting in some businesses, it was a rite of passage yeah. um, to, to overindulge. I think um, OH&S, drink driving, all those sorts mm-hmm. of things, change in society's attitudes once you become mature has contributed to that because peer pressure certainly would have been there for a lot of occasions. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, and I've experienced it myself. I was in corporate for 10 years, almost 10 years ago, and at every function, every conference we'd go to, I'd go to, there was always that um, boys club and yeah. everyone was getting hammered. <laughs> like it was who can stay up the longest sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, and as I haven't been in that space for nearly 10 years now, but it's good to hear from you and your experience that that has changed. And I think it comes down to, you know, your pe- protecting your people, looking after your people. As Correct. Well. Um, so you you obviously go to a lot of functions, Ray. Um, when people first meet you and if they – it's a natural thing to offer somebody a drink if you, if you yeah. first meet someone – Often some of our listeners, are they they grapple with the line of what to say, like I don't drink or I'm not drinking. Yeah. What what are some of the things that you say and how have some of the, the reactions been over the years? Give us yeah. some of the more memorable ones, if there's any. Well, I, I, obviously before, you know, before it became acceptable, people would have a soda water or not drink or whatever. I wasn't saying that was difficult because I'm, I'm not a shy person in any shape or form, but it was just, you know, Probably the first ten years. Well, he's a weirdo. We don't need to talk to him. The, you know, and but later on, it became more acceptable. I think the you know, if it's every corporate function you walk in, there's three or four way to stand there with a tray of drinks from wine to beer, to um, spirits or whatever. So I, I just simply say to them, no, thank you, I'm fine. They don't care. Their, their job is to serve. I'm not being condescending, but that's what it is. Then if other people see you without a drink, so look, I, I, I don't drink. They look at you weirdly sometimes, but most people, okay, then. But see, there's more people of it now. So I think if you're just yeah. polite, um, don't need to make it. I have no interest in making myself a martyr or a do-gooder or standing out or whatever. That's what people do is is, is their choice. So just be polite. If I'm, I'm choosing not to drink, um, you, know, you know, I won't be having wine. I'll just be having soda water. People, it, 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 it sometimes for me it's easy um, because I'm not a shy person. But some people would take courage to say that. You know, particularly if they're if they're young or they're trying to impress somebody or whatever. But if someone asks you, look, I, I've I treat this function seriously. I treat this event seriously. I, I want to do that, so I'm just uh, taking the opportunity not to drink, and that's and people accept that now. That's yeah. what just just be cool, calm, straight. Don't try and hide anything. <laughs> like that, calm and strong is a bit of a mantra of mine. I actually had an experience recently. I was at the pub with some uh, some quite heavy boozers, some males, and they were sort of that older generation, and they were hanging it on me because I was drinking non-alcoholic beer. So they're really giving it to me, and then one of them said to me, "Is like, well, why don't you drink?" And I said, because I'm a better mum when I don't. Yep. And he said, good on you. And that sort of yep. shut the conversation down. He had nowhere to go. So I was like, it was a nice feeling that he, yeah. he got it as well. Yep. Love that. Love that. But it gets, but uh, I'm sure I, I, I sit with friends and I travel with friends. They sit by a nice fire in the lobby at after a function. They relax with a nice d- dessert wine or some whiskey or whatever. It must be fantastic. Mm. More power to them. Couldn't be happier for them. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so with the First National, when it comes to alcohol, what sort of culture have you built in First National real estate? The um, ag- Again, I mean, we, we probably run 50 major events and another 150 not-so-major events around both countries. Um, I would say without exception, um, uh, on the rare occasion, we may have one or two people that overindulge, and we just have a quiet word to them because they generally become dopey. So it's not it's not hard <laughs> to do and everything. Um, and then the vast majority of people enjoy the enjoy the alcohol, and they use it to contribute, have a great time, and dance better, and party better, and all those sorts of things. So I, I I would actually say with hand on heart, we've never had any terrible experiences. Um, you know, I've heard a couple of stories the next morning where someone tried to walk home at the resort hotel and they they had to relieve themselves of excess luggage from their throat um, in the gardens and that sort of stuff. Well, to me, that's just funny, and yeah. and they see that as funny. And uh, so, so no, I, I would think that the culture we've built and it's one of responsibility. Um, you know, we we have a protection uh, to everybody that comes to our functions to make sure it's a safe environment because. We may have um, our industries, you know, over half the people working in our industry is women. I'm very proud of that. And um, majority of them are property managers and they're young ladies. And if they're coming to their first function, I take the responsibility as a father to make sure that, you know, they're in a good environment with their careers and their lives being enriched by coming to that function. That's Brilliant. awesome. Yeah. That's unreal. Um, so when, like, when I think of networking, I think of 
you know, booze being sloshed everywhere <laughs> when you yeah. go to functions. <laughs> and you often hear, you know, that they, you, you meet people after, you know, 10 o'clock at night at functions and you're all getting along because everyone's drinking. For people who are listening to this podcast right now going, there's no way I could go to a function and not drink or there's no way yeah. I could, you know, build up a relationship. And given that real estate is, you know, the relationship yeah. factor is so important, what advice would you give to people? And I know you're a really confident person, Ray, and I yeah. think Meso and I are – similar to you in that confidence space, but for someone who is a bit shy and introverted, what advice would you give to them going to a function without, with not drinking and, and to network? First off, go to your manager or to one of your work colleagues and say, look, I, I'm, I want to go. I just feel a bit uncomfortable. I don't like talking to people, you know, and if I drink, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but it may, may loosen me up a bit and may give me a bit more bravado and confidence. And hopefully they will take you under their wing, you know, and um, just 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 be with you and accommodate you and help you in the conversations. They'll then choose to sit you with people of like minded like. Um, and I might advise some of like I always say to my staff, you know, there's three people here have never been before. Your job is to take care of them introduce them to people and so that gives them confidence because there's nothing worse than when you walk into a function and it's full of say 300 people of oh, they all know each other and they're all telling stories of last year and last week and you're the new duck on the base and you don't know what to do you got no funny stories oh give me a drink um, yeah. so let's take away that leverage because everyone's got a story to tell um just find out what they are so it's about making them feel comfortable but if you don't don't allow yourself to be vulnerable in the first place. They can't make you comfortable. So just ask the question. And if you if you haven't got a boss or colleagues that uh, will look after you like that, change your job. What a great support network. Love Love it is. Yes. Well, I want to come work for you. <laughs> Good. We look forward to that. <laughs> Ray, we want to know the highs and lows of sobriety, but can you tell us a story back in 2017? Um, about the convention to support a charity. Can you give us the story? Oh, you, about you that? girls have done your research. I like this. <laughs> I, I, I never, I know, don't know what's coming up now, but that's a 2017. Well, that would be um, we we run a convention every year, which every second year is overseas. And um, that year we were in Fiji. Um, one, we like to support that country. Our foundation supported a big school there, primary school. We gave over 20,000 worth of um, books and pens and exercise and rubber books and uh, rubber pencils. And we built a covered walkway for the girls to go where they go to their toilet, in a, not in a tropical rain, and we gave them some computers. So that was a, the, the highlight of the convention for me. But for many, the highlight of the convention was we have a charity auction during our award ceremony. There's probably 400, 500 people there. And... Uh, on a whim, I decided to auction off that I would drink a champagne to the highest bidder. And um, it got up to, I think, about $3,500 before it petered out. And uh, so the in the middle of the award ceremony, the glass of champagne came out. I duly scolded in the, in the right phrase because, of course, I'm so good at that. And uh, my wife was petrified that I was going to fall over. Uh, people then offering me more. And it, it just... It, and I, I'm, I'm a CEO, but I'm an average sort of person, and uh, it just brought a lot of fun and mirth to the occasion. And uh, the, we, we auctioned off my T-shirt. I signed it, and the person who paid three and a half thousand dollars that now hangs proudly in their office at the day they got the CEO drunk. And uh, then someone came up afterwards and said, "I'll pay another thousand dollars if you drink another one," which I did. That and my wife took me back to the room because she thought I was going to fall over drunk. So I, I think I was okay. I woke up early the next morning and played golf. So. That's the closest oh. it's been. So it was all for a good cause because the foundation supported those children in Fiji. Incredible. What a great story. I love that. I love it. I love, I'm getting um, Richard Branson vibes off you, Ray. I've got to say. <laughs> oh, that, that, that's very humbling, but thank you. He's a man of the people. He is yeah. the people. Uh, no, I was going to continue on with the highs and lows of sobriety because you have never been drunk. Do you ever feel like you're missing out? I mean, you gave us that beautiful story that your grandma yeah. gave us. Like, yeah. I, I'm so inspired by that. I'm really going to take time to look at the colours and appreciate things, in the, the mundane things. Like, that's extraordinary. What a great bit of advice and insight that well, you had the, as a young boy to know that. It's amazing. All these things come back to you. I was in, I used to do a lot of work in Bali, and I was just probably 20 years old, this story, and a very important businessman, you know, a very important businessman in that whole country. And... Um, we we're doing some very serious work and he invited me to come out to do what he likes to do to relax. And, um, you know, Balinese culture is about flying kites. And, um, 
So we just sat on a cliff up near here, one of his villages, and we flew kites for two or three hours. And Amazing. you know, it, it sounds boring as batshit, but it was just it was just a wonderful time. And um, so I think the you know, it, it's it's obvious um, to just drink and get happy. Um, it's not obvious, but it's a, a blight on our society to take drugs. And that's why people get addicted because the first time you take drugs, I'm told, it, it's such a high. And then you spend the rest of your life trying to get that same high and you never will because mm, yeah. it, was, it was like everything in life, the first time is better. So mm. I think the – and I, I want people to drink. I want alcohol companies to make money. I want people to enjoy a glass of wine during dinner. I couldn't be more happier for that or whatever. It's just like everything in life, the, the excesses are what causes problems. You know, yeah. we all love yeah. that first bite of pizza, but we don't leave the last yeah. one out of the box. Leave that in the box. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the, the excesses of life is what causes problems. So, um, you know, certainly you don't, you don't become a prude or a wowser, but just enjoy what you do and uh, run, run with that and you'll have a happy life. Oh, Such amazing this. advice. Yeah. Um, uh, for any young fellas, Ray, that are in that corporate world or any of our listeners really, um, what advice do you have for them, if they're thinking about cutting back their drinking or completely stopping drinking, what what advice would you have? Just, I know it's a bit difficult. You have yeah, no, but just, just and I see it. Just, just remove yourself from the the ruck you're in of the, of the crowd you're in at that function. And if you're on the other side of the room, if you're observing your behaviour, what would you say? Would you say that person is someone I admire? Would you say that's someone I wouldn't want to get to know or would you say that's someone who's not going ahead in this company or that's someone I want to be with? And you have to remove yourself to think, how are other people perceiving you? Because you may be having fun with those four or five people, you know, making rude jokes and drinking and having a great time exactly as we were in the pub with your mates, but there are people in that room observing you. Mm. And if you were observing yourself, what comment would you make about yourself? And that's that's what I try and do to the, to my people. God, Ray, where were where, you where, 20 years ago? <laughs> where were you when I worked for Telstra, Ray? Where were you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were going to touch on the, your time at the um, CEO at Melbourne Football Club. It was a wonderful time at Melbourne. We weren't a successful team during my era and I take some responsibility for that and I wish we were better. And uh, I couldn't be more happy when they won the premiership last year. And I spoke to lots of people I knew there and it was just a, you know, football you don't have to live in Melbourne to understand how important football is. It, it brings the community together. You, you, you can be a rich man from Turak sitting next to a plumber from um, Eltona um, and both enjoy the football. It's a very unique part of our culture. You know, 43% of people go to the football are women and they enjoy it. And that's why the AFLW is fantastic. Mm. So football clubs are a, a great micronism society, particularly in Melbourne and in Victoria. And um, drinks obviously part of that rough and tough footy culture. And, uh, we had no excesses problems there. The uh, the biggest problem in football is, is is the time that people have on the um, on off the field and off training or whatever. So that leads to gambling issues and social issues, whatever. But football clubs do a tremendous job of helping young men get through those periods. But we pluck them out of their world at seventeen and eighteen, throw them into a football yeah. club where every part of their life is controlled and managed. And then we throw them out of the world when they're 25 to 35 and we say, now go ahead and get on with your life. I think mm. football clubs are doing a great job on that to help them prepare for life after football because the average life in AFL football is just over two years. Um, and those cool. development development years, good or bad, when we're 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, is where we get our career going and they're in a bubble. So I yeah. thoroughly enjoyed my time at the Melbourne Footy Club and I wish them all the success. Tell us how you got involved with that, Ray. Like what was your – you played footy as a youngster. Yep. And how did you become the CEO of the Melbourne Football Club? Uh, it, was just, it, was, it was a corporate, corporate decision, um, you know, and uh, you know, I, I gave up football when I was 21. Whether I was good enough or not, doesn't matter. I wanted to concentrate on my career and that, that's, what, that's what I did. Um, but it was a corporate decision. And, um, you know, the um, – I've been a corporate CEO for 23 years now. Before that, I owned businesses and uh, tried to retire when I was 40. So it's just a progression of uh, of life and experiences and what to do because I, I get most of my joy now about I'm sure my staff are sick of hearing my stories, you know, too many times and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, you know, I was very fortunate in my life. I've had three or four mentors that have taken me aside and said when I was stupid, taken me aside when I said that was a bad mistake. Um, without those people telling me that I would not succeed, whatever success people think I've had or whatever. So yeah, right now to um, 
you know, we've got a young man, he's a, he's a very quiet man. I call him the howdy doody in our organisation. And, um, you know, it, it looks like Theodore Leave it to Beaver, if people know what that means. And uh, <laughs> yesterday in the office here, he came up with some ideas and contradicted what a manager said, and they had a great laugh. And I said, fantastic, because that's what we're going to do and everything. So that development of young people to be able to express themselves in a caring environment is what we're on about. And um, it's particularly after COVID, you know, because we... For those that didn't live in Benigo, it was tough. But in Melbourne here, I'm not going to say it was tough. Because most of us were paid to stay at home or whatever. But it changed the dynamics of how we view ourselves as a society. Mm -hmm. um, my, my, I've done lots of talks on this. And uh, what COVID gave us was a university degree in life that we didn't know we had to do. And yeah. uh, we found out we're in love or less love with that person. Uh, we found out we loved or less love with that job. We found out we did and didn't need that new shirt or something, and uh, it's reevaluated people's lives. And I hope it's for the better. Um, yeah, and um, that's, where, that's where we're heading as a society. We just hope it's going to be better. Absolutely. Did you say tw 23 years you've been CEO of First National? No, 23 years I've been a CEO before, now. Be before that, I used to own my own business, which I sold and tried to retire too early. What was, that <laughs> what was that? That was a, that was a big ad agency. Yeah, yeah. Two thousand four, though. That's got to be some record. I feel. Uh, well, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> it's a long time. Well, we're, we're we're doing well. The market's been great. Uh, the re the reason that real estate's a great we're we're a people industry, and yeah. um, what I love about real estate is we we don't sell homes or houses or apartments. We help people with their dreams, yeah. and uh, there's nothing better than when you sell a house. And Johnny and his brother, Harry, have finally got their own separate rooms after sharing a room for three yeah. or four years. Or, or you know, so the, 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 grand, the daughter, Susan, who's 16, has finally got a bathroom separate to mum and dad. Or there's mm. a backyard to build a cubby house. You know, the, a, a, a house for Australians is not a balance sheet item. It's not an investment tool unless it's a rental prop. It's, it's, a, it's a home, yeah. like that great Australian movie, The Castle. It doesn't matter yeah. whether it's an eighty thousand dollar home or an eighty million dollar home. It's the Australian home, and that's why real estate. We put people in those homes, and that's the great. But there's nothing better than the joy of someone seeing their first home, regardless what the interest rates are, regardless what the mortgage repayments are. That is my castle, and it's unique in Australia and New Zealand. But it's, uh, both countries, it's unique in the world. Mm. Love that you're giving people a piece of world. Correct. Yeah. yeah. World. yeah. yeah. It's not. A, and, and this is where I have some disappointment with the, with the commentary at the moment. We talk about house prices have gone down by 1% or 1.8%. The average Australian doesn't care. Mm. I'm not mm. being flippant by saying that. They yeah, are living right. in their home. Bottom. They are living their dream. Yeah. Yeah. That's not to say there's not some financial austerity not is, is necessary to adjust for mortgage repayments or whatever, but nobody is going to leave their home with their beautiful garden because their mortgage repayments have gone up $80 a month. Mm. Nobody. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he's spot on. I, I actually do the social media for a local real estate agent in Bendigo and I'm constantly asking them for stories. Like when they sell a house, I'm like, okay, what's the story behind it? Who's moving in? What, you know, tell me about them. Tell me about their family. It's always yep. that, you know, what's the connect, What's that relationship? What's that connection mm. to the home? Which is actually a great segue. We've got a, a quick series of rapid fire questions for you, Ray. Okay. So, Mesa's yeah. going to take the helm. Well, I better start paying attention. <laughs> yeah, buck, buck, buckle up, Ray. <laughs> Test your buzzer. All right. Did you barrack for the Melbourne Football Club before coming set, becoming CEO? <laughs> no, I buried for the Sydney Swans all my life, but one day in the Melbourne Football Club, I was red and blue through and through. <laughs> <laughs> Who was your favourite player at Melbourne? Russell Robertson. Oh, nice one. And what about Sydney? Um, Sydney at the moment, it's Lou Parker, but uh, my favourite player was Greg Williams back in the day. Yeah, nice. Tell us, Ray, you've rubbed shoulders with a lot of famous people. Who's been your favourite and who were you most starstruck by? Um, Don't be shy. <laughs> the, the the one I was most struck shy was Margaret Thatcher. Wow. Um, and the yeah. the one that I had, it's too long a story to tell, the most funniest stories with Mikhail Gorbachev. Oh, wow. <laughs> Send back to us later. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the, um, I was stuck on a private tour of the Vatican one day and uh, going for a whole range of different reasons and going in the lift um, down to one of the floors. The Pope came in the lift and we had a good chat about his time as the <gasps> priest at Nova Huta in Poland. So that was that was probably the most starstruck one. Wow. <laughs> oh, that's... We, can't, we can't beat that. <laughs> <laughs> that's massive. Who would you love to meet? 
Um, well, there's a there's about twenty or thirty. I would. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd like to give somebody. I'd love to meet um, Lindy Chamberlain. I'd love. I'd love to chat with her. Uh, I think that's an intriguing story of. Um, goodness, badness, mistreatment, um, unkind judgment, a whole range of things. So it'd be great to just have, have, a, have a chat to her. Um, so let, let's make – but there's, there's another range. I, I, would, I would love to meet people and just say, why did you do that? Why were you so stupid? <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you lots of stupid things. Yeah. <laughs> um, we want to know – talk to us about the prediction um, – of rates. <laughs> when are they yeah, going to stop right. going up, Ray? Yeah, I'm sick of getting letters from my bank. <laughs> um, well, it, it, it's, I, I press up this by saying if we don't control inflation, inflation hasn't been in Australian society for probably 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're old enough to remember what inflation does to your savings, your asset base, your wages, then you have no idea about it. So we must destroy inflation. The Reserve Bank will probably overpay their hand by destroying it too much. That'll have some social consequences, but I support their theory to do that. So my prediction, mortgage interest rates will probably reach 6 or 7% by March next year and then start to decline. Um, the, but inflation's a main game. So the short-term pain to have an, have an economy where inflation's rampant for 20 years or five years or two years is a disaster. Just look at Venezuela or Germany before World War II and you understand what that is. So the short-term pain... Um, of mortgage rates going up. Well, mortgage rates hadn't gone up for 11 years before May this year. Yeah. So that that was a long time when your $1,000 a month mortgage was a fixed amount. Mm. Um, and there'd been a million people that had never known interest rate rises. So I have sympathy for people's family budgets. And my advice is restructure to live within your means, um, exactly like we did during COVID times. And uh, let's get the inflation under control and let's see what happens in the next 18 months. Yeah. Love that. What about mould? Last question. What about mould? Are we going to oh. ask about mould, Meso? <laughs> oh. <laughs> get mold out of the kitchen. For background to your listeners, uh, I'm doing a series of mould interviews at the moment. Because with, with El Nina, the um, mould's becoming a big issue, particularly in northern New South Wales and Queensland, the southern highlands in whatever. So my, my main thing with mould is open your windows Put the internal exhaust fans on and keep your house clean and mop up. <laughs> yeah. As my wife said, I don't even know where the mop is, but I'm giving that advice. <laughs> and the final question, Ray, um, selling sunsets, is that what real estate's really like? <laughs> I've met a couple of people on the Selling Sunset show. We, we, did, we did a lot of work in the States or whatever. So oh, I need to no, ask that, who, who, which ones did you meet? No, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep that for another time. Keep that for chapter Are two. You make appearance no right, it's going to be a no no no, no 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 shape or form um real estate in the states is a lot different you actually have two agents one representing the buyer one representing the seller whereas here oh. we just represent the seller and the buyer comes to us so it, it is a it is a different environment but uh the there's a great phrase not just for real estate the fee you've paid for me to do is not for the short time i've worked with you it's for my years experience to make it better for you and oh, yep. uh, selling sunset and all those real estate shows give the impression they just make a phone call, you just do this, you show something, you look good, and you sell a house. Yeah. Um, it's the it's it's certainly not that. There's years of work that goes behind and building up contacts and database to those sorts. So selling sunset represents what we'd all like it to be in Los Angeles because <laughs> every house is beautiful, oh, every house is an easy sale, yeah. everybody can find another million dollars. But uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a great illusion, like all escape TV should be. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that's why we're all sucked into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our last segment, Ray, is uh, phone fuck up with a PH. Now, normally we ask our guests um, what they've done, if they had a mishap with their phone when they've been under the influence. But given you don't, but you're never under the influence, is there anything you've done sober with your phone or technology that's been a bit of a doozy? It's a phone fuck up with a PH. So we can give an F with a call or text. Phone fuck up with the I was having a very, 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 very <laughs> heated discussion with someone we had great conflict in opinion <laughs> and um i had the phone on speaker for legal reasons i wanted someone else to listen to it and um which they were aware of and when the conversation ended i thought i'd hung up the phone but i hadn't <laughs> and i made some commentary about that person which perhaps wasn't too kind um and they reminded me of that for about the next three or four years so <laughs> 
<laughs> That's a ripper. That's a ripper. <laughs> so ma- ma- maybe if I'd been under influence, I would have had an excuse. So <laughs> yeah. who knows? It's time for the recommendation of the week. What brought, brought me joy this week is uh, how great Robbie Williams was at the grand final because oh. after that, there wasn't much joy in the uh, in the in the grand final. But what what's brought me joy this week is uh, seeing all those little kids in their catch jumpers running around celebrating, having the time of their lives. Because when you watch any grand final, even so rugby league or soccer, but particularly AFL, you see bo- rows of people that are going through the depths of despair. And then within half a meter, you have rows of people going through the greatest time of their lives. And that's that's a micronism of life. It's where you sit and it's how you see it that makes it important. Now, for the people with the cats, it's been the greatest time of their lives and I fully support it. For us Swans people, well, there's always next week or next year, as they yeah. say, and that's the great thing about it. But uh, I think the, the, the joy in life, I went to the show yesterday with uh, one of my staff who'd never been to the show oh, before. Oh, I was there too. <laughs> and um, we bought her a first show bag and uh, she sent me the photo last night and she comes from overseas so she'd never know what the show was about. Oh. And the show bag she bought, she sent me a photo, she put all the um, all the items on display and took a photo of them. And oh, um, she's in the middle 30s. I said, that's exactly what all the kids do in Australia when they get home. They line up all their show bag stuff. So that brought me great joy as well, seeing that oh, photo. I, I that. just got goosebumps. Same show bags. So <laughs> simple, so effective. I love this. Ray, you have been so generous with your time and I've learned so much. Can you be my mentor? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Happy. I, I speak to lots of people, happy to do it. I, I, I do lots of stupid things, trust me. And I make lots of mistakes. Yeah. And my wife says sometimes I can be very difficult to live with, so let's not just leave it at that. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure I've disappointed people along the journey, and I apologise for that. But uh, you know, just got to get out of bed the next day and make the, make tomorrow better than today. Simple as that. Oh, so, it's such a positive ball of energy, Ray. Yep. We yes. really appreciate your time, um, and thanks for coming on Booze Free Pants podcast. We've absolutely loved our chat. Thank so you very much. much. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> See you soon, ladies, and thanks, thank you everybody Ray. for listening. Appreciate it. Bye. Thanks, Ray. This podcast is proudly produced by our audio engineer, music extraordinaire, Eric Ladd. We love you, Eric.